dipping tobacco is placed between the cheek and gum, and ever since it was introduced by Scandinavian immigrants to America, it has quickly become a silent but strong and inextricable part of deep Americana. It is because of this ubiquity, I feel, that no serious documentation effort has been done to dipping tobacco at all. You have some reviews on YouTube, but very few of them with any rigor, and documentation on a serious basis has only happened really within the last decade. This leaves many products hanging by a thread to uh, total oblivion by way of forgetfulness. Now, the video you're about to watch, I don't mean to claim at all that this is a serious documentation effort. Those are being done much better by others in the same field. I just want to talk about things I find freaky, strange, rare, or worth discussing that one day might be forgotten. Enjoy. Distinct from the company's short-lived snooze product, Marlboro Moist Snuff was available for two years in two flavors and two cuts, Original and Wintergreen, long and fine, respectively. Original was likely a natural flavor dip, as Marlboro Snuff was simply Husky Moist Snuff rebranded under a more popular and widely recognized brand mark. Altria's acquisition of United States smokeless tobacco ended the Marlboro Moist Snuff experiment. Dipping tobacco was available on the market under the brand Rooster during two different times. The first Rooster dip was available somewhere around the early 70s, and it was a natural dip, likely to have been rebranded from Viking Snuff to appeal to the southern United States with its link to the brand cache of Rooster Dry Snuff, which already existed at the time. Rooster appears once again in 1996. According to all available reports on the product, it came in three flavors, Bold Winter Green, Icy Mint, and Wild Berry. It was meant to compete directly with American snuff company's Grizzly Moist Snuff, which reflects in almost all of the advertising documentation available to us today. In an interview, between a former United States Smokeless Tobacco Company employee and Smokeless Tobacco researcher and Snuff Taker's ephemeris writer, Mr. Hubbard, USST entertained suing Alice in Chains, a rock band, over the song Rooster, but instead directed their advertising towards that demographic instead of fighting the association. They adopted a 90s alternative rock image and took a lot of design language from other products targeting that same market. It does look a little gaudy nowadays, but um, the design languages of different eras uh, might have seemed cool at a time. I don't know. I never really grew up in that world. It was once a nationwide product, but Rooster was quietly reduced to only a few select markets before being completely discontinued following Altria's acquisition of the United States Smokeless Tobacco Company in 2009. And Mr. Hubbard describes the product as follows. It was, in my opinion, terrible snuff. The wild berry, which you would assume would probably be a dumbed-down skull berry, uh, using cheaper ingredients was like chewing on dry Kool-Aid particles. Happy Days was a smokeless tobacco product introduced by USST in 1967. At that time, it was just UST. Along with sister brand Good Luck, Originally, Happy Days was only launched in Raspberry, whereas Good Luck was launched in Lemon. This uh, one flavor per brand approach might seem a little weird to us today, who are used to not only things like, um, like dipping tobacco, but also pretty much everything. I mean, uh, Coca-Cola releasing new flavors, like the new Starlight, which tastes uh, kind of foul. I believe is uh, just another manifestation of using a popular brand's mark to sort of carry new flavors or new ideas, uh, make them more popular than they might otherwise be if they were introduced under a completely new brand. But the one flavor per uh, name approach was really common back in the day, especially with dip. Uh, so to elaborate, right? Copenhagen was, for many years, only available in a natural flavor in a snuff cut, and Skull was only a wintergreen. 
Eventually, Happy Days would have mint added to the brand, and Good Luck would add a winter green as things started to open up in their approach. Eventually, both of these brands would be discontinued, and their flavors in some way, shape, or form would be added to the Skull line. According to Hubbard, Skull Citrus and Skull Berry were at one time equivalent to Good Luck Lemon and Happy Days Raspberry, respectively. Although the names of these flavors are the same and their equivalencies did at one time exist, apparently the formula changed between then and now, and the Skull flavors are far more tobacco forward than they ever once were. The cut was changed quietly sometime around 1988, transitioning from a snuff cut to a longer cut, although the company has not responded on this issue, and documentation for this change is, shall we say, uh, non-existent. The existing advertising and documentation online, and there is a lot of it, because it is a UST product, shows Happy Days Skull and Copenhagen advertised together on the same magazine advertisements and pamphlets. Uh, the classic Walt Garrison, uh, who are some other dudes who were in there? I, Walt Garrison's really the only one that I can remember at this point, but uh, nevertheless, Happy Days and Good Luck were apparently advertised together in in-store advertising and apparently treated with the same prestige. In advertising available to me, Happy Days is presented as being mild, probably intended as either a gateway product for new tobacco users or smokers looking for an easy-to-take product that won't present a challenging or bold taste that they may find unfamiliar or off-putting. I remember when I was a smoker, and I was a smoker for about a year, I did a approach pack a day, but it never got quite so bad, and that was many years ago now. Uh, I tried dip. I was actually looking for the snooze. Uh, far more interested in that product even today, but dipping tobacco is kind of interesting to me still. And it was, if I remember correctly, it was Grizzly Wintergreen, and I tried it, and it was such an aggressive flavor. Um, I remember it tasting very sour and bold. Of course, nowadays, I do enjoy the stuff, but for a smoker, um, it's about the nicotine fix. It really isn't about the flavor. So I remember it being a little bit disgusting, a little bit off-putting to me, at least at the time. So something like a mint, something like a raspberry, especially if they are very, very strongly flavored, as Hubbard suggests that they were, and he's personally tried these products, then I can imagine they would be a little bit easier for a smoker to uh, allow the pun, if you will, chew on, right? There was another flavor in a blue can that was apparently a test market flavor. It came in a denim, denim, a denim can, um, but the flavor is unknown. Uh, the denim can sort of crawls to mind something like Rala Snus, which is a Snus brand, uh, Snus Mark, put out by Swedish Match that came back briefly uh, in recent memory. But uh, the flavor is unknown, and requests for comment from USST went unanswered. Tahoe was a dip offered by a company called s and Brands, which appears to have been a smaller regional brand focusing on bargain-priced cigarettes and other tobacco products for the budget market. The product was never sold internationally, from my information but did enter a select few other markets, according to those who I've spoken about the dip to. The flavors run the standard gamut you would expect. They offer wintergreen and natural in both long and fine cuts, and they offered a straight in a long cut. This was probably similar in taste to other budget dipping tobaccos that don't pasteurize their stuff. Something like Kayak Silver Creek in its modern form, or maybe even Decade. Sequoia was a brand of dip sold by Swedish Match, which is uh, probably no stranger to those of you who are familiar with my channel, but Swedish Match owns Pinkerton, which makes the Longhorn and Timberwolf line of dipping tobaccos. They also uh, make snus for the Scandinavian and European market, and some limited snus for the North American market as well. They also own a couple of different things like uh, Red Man, which is now, as of the time of recording, called America's Best Chew. 
they own White Owl Cigars, a bunch of other different things. Massive company. The brand was sold in two unique flavors at the time. A Mountain Cider, which was an apple flavor, apparently very similar to Timble, Timble Wolf. What? Timberwolf apple is today, and Cinnamon Ice, which is more than likely a mentholated cinnamon flavor Notorious, from what I've read on forums from those who have tried it, notorious for its intense burning mouthfeel. Forum posts from those who did try it record receiving a free promotional multi-tool along with the purchase of the product near its inception, but I can't find any records of what the multi-tool itself was like. The texture of the product was, according to Hubbard, very snooze-like in terms of moisture and flavor. Very much like Timberwolf and Longhorn which are two currently produced dipping tobaccos owned ultimately by Swedish Match. I don't know if this is an equivalency I would agree with right off the bat. I have had Longhorn before. And I do find, although it is a uh, rougher cut, it is cut to begin with and snus is ordinarily ground or milled, I do find that it has a tackier, uh, kneaded-esque texture that's kind of, although not quite, kind of similar to snus. The product was also pasteurized, as Swedish and Scandinavian snus is today. It was sold in a metal can in a lugnut-esque design. Camel Moist Snuff, which is frequently advertised as the then colloquial term a camel dip, was a brand of dipping tobacco first introduced in Colorado and Florida by Conwood, which is now ASC, the American Snuff Company a subsidiary of Reynolds American. Sometime during 2009, it's aimed at the, or it was aimed at the premium smokeless tobacco market. Two varieties were available at the brand's inception, Wintergreen Wide Cut and Dark Milled, both products shipped in metal cans. The brand was introduced with aims to capitalize on large declines in smoking rates coinciding with consistent growths in the smokeless tobacco market space in the years leading up to 2009. Remember, this is in the modern day, but it's a very weird time uh, where cigarettes, you know, the safety of cigarettes, the cats kind of out of the bag, so to speak. Um, but people are looking for an alternative. It is also a time before popular adoption of vapes. I think the first vaporizer, the first electronic cigarette was uh, invented in China in 2009. So this is well before popular adoption. Not long after the introduction of the product, Conwood LLC changed its name to the American Snuff Company, and a decision was made during the restructuring to focus efforts on marketing Grizzly and Kodiak Snuff, which came at the expense of Camel Dip. Shortly after these events, Grizzly Dark variations are released, products considered by many to be spiritual successors to the original Camel Dipping tobaccos. According to a hypothesis put forward by Jared of Outlaw Dip, at least one of these products, Wintergreen Wide Cut, bears a striking, striking, what the hell? A striking resemblance to Grizzly Dark Wintergreen. The dark milled though is unique and it's uh, it's not exactly, it's not even close to what uh, Dark Select is today. It had a snuff-esque grind alluded to by the name Dark Milled, and by many accounts, it was an ordinary natural dip with strong notes of peat and a lemony aftertaste. And this is backed up by old YouTube videos of people dipping on camera, which is a very popular phenomenon of the early 10s. No extraordinary flavor notes are commented upon. Most of these and the videos are in very rough quality but most of the people say it's just a natural snuff cut dip. A product only known from convenience store press statements and apparently never released. It was intended to be sold at a budget price bracket and the aforementioned statements highlighted the comparatively minor amount of carcinogens, 65% less if I remember correctly, as a major selling point for the product. It was probably pasteurized, or made of tobacco that wasn't fire-cured, as fermentation and fire-cured tobacco are both known to contain greater proportions of carcinogenic material, although the carcinogens in questions are never revealed. 
Had it come to market, it would have been released in a mint flavor, a straight flavor, and a wintergreen flavor. The cut, although never mentioned, was more than likely long cut. The company responsible for Predator, Southern Smokeless, is also responsible for other dipping tobacco brands that featured surprising innovation in what can be thought of as a mostly stagnant market with little flavor or uh, quality variation. Dips are very homogenous if you think about it compared to stuff like snus or nasal snuff. Manufactured by the previously mentioned Southern Smokeless, Revved Up was a brand of dipping tobacco that advertised containing caffeine, taurine, and guarana, all ingredients common to energy drinks like Monster and Red Bull. Ostensibly, this was in service of their target market of emergency services personnel and other late night workers. This product is unique in that these ingredients are blended into a traditional tobacco based dip instead of being added to a herbal or coffee ground based blend as is done with many tobacco cessation products or alternatives for people who do not prefer nicotine. The product was available as late as 2016, at least according to when the website eventually went under or delisted the product on archive.org. It came in a wintergreen and a mint flavor. According to those who have tried it, the dip has no extraordinary flavor and the amounts of active stimulants added to the tobacco have no qualitative effect on the body. Now, I differ from a lot of people in the sense in that I do drink quite a lot of coffee. Um, so some people may tolerate the amounts of caffeine in it differently. However, I am floating around 800 milligrams per day, maybe a little bit higher if I have a long night or I'm working out and take a pre-workout. And I find that things like, take a popular product that's out right now, Grinds, which is a sort of in between a smoking secession, or smoking secession, a smokeless secession product and a stimulant that you can buy at the store if you're tired of Monster. Uh, they kind of sit in between and their branding is kind of weird. That product, which is one of the big things they advertise, is it energizes you. It has 50 milligrams of caffeine in their double strength product. But keep in mind that a ordinary medium pike place roast from Starbucks contains 330 milligrams of caffeine. And also keep in mind that a lot of these caffeinated dips uh, insist that if you feel comfortable, you can just spit all that caffeine right out. If it works for you, and it's what you want, and you enjoy these products, I have no problem recommending them to you. But if you want them to sort of power you up, maybe just drink a cup of coffee. The same goes for this product, which is probably why it didn't make too many waves in the market that was already kind of uh, being pressured on by the newly instated PACT Act and subsequent tobacco and smokeless tobacco restriction laws active in the US government at the time. This is another product from Southern Smokeless and a very mysterious one. All specialists I've contacted, including Jared from Outlaw and Mr. Hubbard, are unfamiliar with the dip. The only information available, even photos of this product, from the archived version, again, of Southern Smokeless's website are broken, so I have no idea what it looks like, is that these products are available in two different flavors, or were. Duke's 1876, which was a spiced snuff with a hickory flavor, probably similar to Cope Smooth Hickory, meaning a straight dip with a strong wood smoke note, and Duke's 50 Caliber, which was a dip with a sharp mesquite flavor, and possibly another modified straight, although this is uncertain. Uh, remember, all I have to go on for Dukes, at least, are the product descriptions on a website that hasn't been active for a product that saw very limited reach in the United States. Skull Bandits were a pouched dipping tobacco introduced in 1983, developed and targeted towards consumers who were not traditionally consumers of dipping tobacco, according to internal papers and advertisements dated near the height of the product's popularity. The product does not deviate tremendously from ordinary skull recipes, and it consists of ordinary skull, wintergreen, and mint, 
with small anticipated expected differences in cut and moisture placed into pouches. These pouches are a great deal smaller than dipping to bulk. Dipping to bulk. These products are a great deal smaller than ordinary dipping tobacco pouches that we would expect to buy today, even a, a little bit smaller than the one gram regular portions that we would see if we're a snooze user. According to advertising, this product was intended for the bottom lip rather than being placed in the upper lip as smokeless tobacco is in Europe. The development of portion snooze in Sweden at around the same time as uh, UST's push for bandit advertising led the company to expand the product into the Scandinavian market, eventually to a wider European market as a whole. The product was unpopular in Scandinavia, selling no more than around uh, 10,000 cans on average per year. However, discussions surrounding the safety of dipping tobacco in the United States and fears over a foreign and potentially dangerous product entering a market with a strong domestic tobacco market already losing sales to ongoing fears over cigarette safety, among a multitude of other factors caused many markets to outright ban all forms of moist snuff, including snus and dip. Skull Dry, which was a originally Skull Snus, but the original version of Skull Snus, not the latter version, not the one that exists today. It was a spitless, smokeless tobacco product akin to Snus, but not quite the same, introduced in 2006, targeting more or less the same market as Skull Bandits once did. Current smokers who were looking to switch to smokeless but didn't want to be associated with a demographic assumed to use dip or for current dippers that were looking for a more discreet product to occasionally uh, use in places or situations where spitting was not an option. The marketing, sleek and cool, and making heavy use of early turn of the millennium design language was probably targeting the former foremost. If you are uh, sort of grew up around the same time as I did, you will remember the advertising for Something like the PlayStation Portable, even, is what this stuff reminds me of sometimes. The product came in three flavors at the time of its inception. Regular, which was probably not a natural dip flavor, it was probably a sweetened natural-esque in line with Camel Snooze's current line of natural flavors, heavily cased, heavily topped with things like vanilla and uh, maybe a hint of tonka, if you will. Came in menthol as well, and cinnamon. And of note, of interest to me of all these is menthol, which is a flavor that has basically no uh, name association with dipping tobacco products, but a strong cachet with smokers and the wider general product. Um, you may uh, not be a dipper and not understand what wintergreen is and tastes like, but even people who have never smoked in their life understand that menthol is something cooling. Skull Dry was eventually refined and developed into the current iteration of Skull Snooze, which is still sold nationwide. And this change is probably in response to the surprise popularity of the current iteration of Camel Snooze, which is still, to this day, one of the highest grossing smokeless tobacco products in North America. Introduced in 2003 and discontinued in 2011, Skull Vanilla Blend was a vanilla-flavored dipping tobacco well-beloved by dippers who remember it, although not a lot of them claim to have only bought the dip um, as something as a mainstay tobacco product, usually an occasional treat. Those who have tried the product remember it tasting, among other things, like pound cake, first and foremost. He was an early blandning, which is Swedish for blend, here used in reference specifically to the types of snus used in the 1800s and early 1900s by Scandinavian immigrants, made with fermentation instead of pasteurization. If you want to check out a video on the development of early snus into dip, you can see a very rough video I made on it on my channel. According to researcher Hubbard, it was originally called Kalmart Nykel which is older Swedish for Key of Kalmar, and it was a Jotobor style snus with a rougher cut, somewhere between modern Copenhagen snuff and uh, long cut. 
Key was renamed Skull Key after the brand was consolidated into the Skull brand mark in the 1970s. Some forum users I've talked to recall it having a peppery, chili-esque finish, and others recall a lighter, more herbal taste without the heavy smoke note of Copenhagen snuff. Key's memory is important as it is one of the many Blandning import snus available during the time, of which one is still currently available, and you probably know it, it is Copenhagen snuff. Skull Key was eventually discontinued after over a century of production, but some report seeing it as late as 1997. As of the time of recording this video, it is long, long gone. Skull Ready Cut was a sort of portioned dip, wherein the dip had been pressed into small briquettes for convenience. It was available from 2012 to 2013, a very short time for a product to be out from a national company, and the flavor menu was straight, mint, and wintergreen. Controversy surrounded the Ready Cut line, as dippers who shore the compressed tobacco into a loose cut suspected that Skull was underfilling the can using the supposed compression as a way to disguise uh, underfilling the product. This little imbroglio, along with pouched products gaining heavily in popularity and already satisfying the target market, i.e. dippers looking for a quicker and cleaner way to use dip, all factored into the removal of Skull Ready Cut from the market. Another product released a year before in Sweden, Fiedler and Lundgren's Fall Bakad, uh, used the same principle as Skull Ready Cut, may have served as inspiration for USST's product or simply affirmation for possible product market success. Because you have to remember, USST and Altria are always looking at what Swedish Match is doing and Swedish Match does the same in turn. If uh, the release of American Velo by RJ Reynolds, after seeing the success of nicotine pouches in Scandinavia, doesn't convince you, uh, maybe this will. It's been going on for a long time. In reality, both products quickly failed after they were released. Um, due to all the factors I mentioned before, uh, probably mainly the controversy and the pouch success. Copenhagen Black was a seasonal variety of Copenhagen dipping tobacco available in limited markets until its total discontinuation sometime in the last half of the first decade of the millennium. It was bourbon flavored and advertised initially as having a mid-cut, wherein the strands of tobacco are cut shorter than long cut. Although, in reality, Copenhagen long cut probably falls under this category as well, as it is far shorter sheared than the other long cut dips in Copenhagen's line, let alone the entire USST portfolio. A lot of dippers will be able to tell you that the cut of Copenhagen long cut natural is pretty unique and is probably a mid cut despite the advertising. The dip was divisive, with many forum posters who remember it recalling it having a flavor reminiscent of Play-Doh, and with many others who liked it recalling it fondly and wishing for its return. Copenhagen Snus Launched by USST to test market somewhere around 2012 to 2014, Copenhagen Snus was a snus manufactured with the Swedish snus process. And according to tobacco researcher and expert Chad Jones of snooby.com, the wintergreen compared very strongly with Grizzly Longcut, the mint with Jakobsen's Mint Strong, which is a, if you don't know, a snus brand in Sweden that was, although they mainly focus on other things ever since their acquisition by a Swedish match, once upon a time they were known for having very, very large portions, very moist with very bold sweet flavors, uh, strongly reminiscent of American dip. There was a natural as well, and Chad compared that strongly with budget Swedish snus instead of the natural smoky fermented dip taste. Uh, he said it was something like Caliber. The Cope line was released by USST in September of 2007 with a focus on conversion of current smokers towards the use of smokeless tobacco products according to a press release contained in an archived version of a convenience store news site. The products came in three flavors, Smooth Hickory, 
which is a natural with a slight hickory flavoring, whiskey, and straight. The objective of the line was to present a more relaxed and distinguished image of moist snuff to other tobacco users and to introduce them to the product via a line of, uh, like I said, more relaxed, smoother, and dignified flavors. The line was discontinued some years after, probably in response to waning sales and the release of the wildly popular Copenhagen Wintergreen and Copenhagen Mint some years later, which caused a shift in company focus away from natural flavor profiles, though in reality, it was probably going to happen eventually, even without the release of Wintergreen. The market already trended strongly towards flavors like that to begin with. WB Cut is a dipping tobacco sold mainly in the North Midwest under the guise of being a chewing tobacco to evade what I think uh, an old North Dakotan anti-snuff law. Once upon a time in North Dakota, uh, moist snuff or snuff used for chewing was completely banned, so several companies needed products to work around this law. This is one of those products born out of that necessity. Originally, there was another product in this niche, Wayman Bruton Cut, which was discontinued in the 1980s. Both products show hybridity in their formula, with WB Extra Long Cut being, according to those who have had it, somewhat adjacent to the taste of beech nut chew, but much closer in approximation to a natural dip, heavily salted. Suit and Tie Dip and Chew Guy, another fantastic tobacco researcher, uh, has done a video on this field and uses the product and describes the flavor and the process of it in the mouth with uh, excellent eloquence. I highly recommend you check him out. The product is notable for having an extremely long cut close to angel hair spaghetti where these strands are cut um, or shredded as you would expect from a dip but not separated at regular intervals along those strands to make it easy to pack. In 2017, Copenhagen held a poll on three flavors that website members could vote on. The winner would see limited release in stores across the country. The dips were Wayman's Reserve Blue, which was supposed to be a long cut mint. Wayman's Reserve Green, which was an extra fine cut wintergreen, probably similar to the Cut of Skull original wintergreen fine cut but sweeter with a more aggressive mouthfeel, as Copenhagen Wintergreen is known to have, and Wayman's Reserve Black, which was the winner. It was a smoky, long-cut natural. According to the accounts of those who have tried it, it was most definitely not the Copenhagen Black Bourbon Mid-Cut of old. Wayman's Reserve would eventually see a small release before only being available at the Snuff Store in Nashville, a small museum and dipping tobacco store run by USST. Although, as of the time of filming, the Snuff Store has closed, closed sometime in early 2022, and the return of Wayman's Reserve is unlikely. Viking was a dipping tobacco brand produced by the Helma Company that competed directly with Copenhagen Snuff during the time it was introduced. The dipping tobacco has two names depending on the location it was sold in. Viking Snuff was sold on the East Coast, and Norseman Snuff was sold in the Midwest. According to accounts of those who had tried them, Viking was strikingly similar to Copenhagen in terms of cut and flavor. It was discontinued sometime in the 80s along with the rest of Helma's line of dipping tobacco. Workmate was another dip in the Helma portfolio targeted to compete with Skull Wintergreen. Although it was marketed as a wintergreen snuff, those who tried it recall a menthol taste instead of a true wintergreen, with a more striking flavor of tobacco coming through. If the suspicions of the aforementioned Hubbard are correct, this is because dip was simply the Viking snuff recipe with menthol added to the final product. Launched in the 70s, Gold River was a brand of chewing tobacco currently manufactured by Swisher after a long hiatus following the brand's original production run. It has a long, wide cut very similar to pipe tobacco, which some suspect to have been its base, and it is flavored with maple. 
The can contains slightly less than the ordinary amount of tobacco expected to be in a dip can, just one ounce instead of the ordinary 1.2 ounces. A surprising fact about this product is its popularity in Sweden, where it is looked favorably upon by users of several Swedish news forums, many written during its production hiatus and lamenting its absence. The brand is currently produced by Fat Lip, a subsidiary of Swisher, and available in limited markets in the United States. Another snuff previously manufactured by the now-defunct Helmut Company. Not much is known about this tobacco, but notes provided to me by Mr. Hubbard explain that it was originally regionally limited to the southeastern corridor and was identical to Helmut's wild cherry snuff, flavored identically. Uh, the similarities in taste between dark sweet cherry cordial and by extension fruity liqueurs such as brandy cannot be missed, and it was available in a fine cut. The few that liked it and told me how it tastes uh, recall that they did not like it very much at all. This is simply the previous name of Grizzly Lanka Natural. By all accounts, the dip from dippers who have had both, it is exactly the same product. The dip came in a gold-lidded can, probably inspired by the color of Copenhagen Long Cut. 1900 was probably chosen to artificially manufacture a sense of old-timey feeling. Redwood was a budget snuff manufactured, at least for a time, by Swisher International, although the brand no longer appears on the company's website. It is nearly universally despised by those who have tried it, with the tobacco researcher and collector suit and tie dip and chew guy saying that it might have been the worst tasting thing I've ever put in my mouth. The brand is quite old, and in older advertising, likely dating from the 70s or 80s, it is always compared to Copenhagen snuff, with advertising pushing the fact that it only costs half as much as the aforementioned premium product. Tough Guy was a brand of dip slash chew advertised by Ace Brands. From all accounts, it was a dip labeled as a chewing tobacco to evade taxes. It is significant because of the flavors it was available in, which were uncommon in Dip and Chew. The flavors included lemon, vanilla, and orange in addition to more common dip flavors. Ace would eventually partner with YouTuber Outlaw, and the Tough Guy brand would eventually become Outlaw Dip. Ace would eventually partner with YouTuber Outlaw, and the Tough Guy brand would eventually become Outlaw Dip and changed their formula to become a tobacco-free nicotine dip to preemptively circumvent possible restriction from the federal government. Stoker's Wintergreen Chill is a blend of dips sold exclusively in South America. By all accounts, it is an ordinary Stoker's dip with a taste of mentholated wintergreen. It is the second of the South America exclusive Stoker's dips. On all accounts, it is a slightly mellow or straight-flavored dip by those who have tried it with only a slight accent of bourbon. Red Seal is a brand of dipping tobacco manufactured by USST that released a black cherry blend sometime during the early 2000s, although no clear release date can be found online. No videos or reports of the flavor exist except by a brief mention of Jared from Outlaw, who said that it has a less sharp, sweeter cherry flavor, compared to Skull Cherry, which is also manufactured by USST. Due to the lack of secondhand tins on the resale market and little to no evidence of this dip besides a commonly proliferated advertising sign that I keep finding on my research for this video, it is likely that this dip was uncommon when it was offered and removed from the market quickly after its inception. It is also possible that the cans were simply thrown away, as Red Seal cans are, until recently, entirely plastic, and the lack of a metal lid and the larger size, as Red Seal advertises 25% more tobacco in every can, would discourage collection by enthusiasts and secondhand sellers. Grizzly Snooze was a snooze released by the American Snuff Company sometime in early 2020. 
The product was probably a rebranding of the already very popular Camel Snus, as both brands are owned by Reynolds American. Grizzly Snus appears to have been quickly and quietly discontinued by the American Snuff Company, as no evidence of the product appears on its website as of the time of recording. Chad from Snoopy.com says that these are basically identical to their corresponding brands in the Camel portfolio. Known only by patent information and by a list of ingredients posted on USST's website, Copenhagen Neat Cut is remarkable for containing cotton fiber in its list of ingredients. Based on this, it is possible that it was meant to be a product akin to the failed Skull Ready Cut series, maybe a precursor, or a re-envisioning, or it was to be a dipping tobacco made of reconstituted tobacco, i.e. tobacco flavor, and thank goodness it was not released. Silverback Spitless Tobacco, as it is marketed on its website, is a rebranding of a product called Makla, intended to more closely align with the target demographic of dipping tobacco in the United States. Makla and Silverback are not dipping tobacco, they are Shama or Hema, which are homogenous, highly alkaline, and very strong smokeless tobacco products, usually made with ash and Nicotiana rustica, meant, uh, meant to be placed in the upper lip in very small amounts, quite like snooze. If you want a sort of quasi-anecdotal, but I've received a lot of reports that this is what goes on. Uh, and it can show you how much more it is like snus than dip. In countries where the product is more commonly consumed in its traditional form, like the Maghreb and the central uh, Western European states that it's been introduced to, it is sometimes used as a substitute for the illegal to import snus, and it is placed in a cigarette paper to act as a filter before use. Longhorn Apple Shine is a limited edition dipping tobacco launched under the Longhorn brand sometime in late 2021. By all accounts of those who have tried it and left reviews of the product, it has a Granny Smith apple liqueur flavor and has been well received by those who have tried it. It is currently available as of the time of writing only in limited markets, but the product's reach is wider than some limited edition dips like Wayman's Reserve ever were during the time of the latter's sale. Longhorn Apple Shine is notable because it marks the release of the first apple-flavored dipping tobacco besides Skull Apple Blend in many years, and also one of the first limited edition and uniquer flavors launched after the Pact Act and associated laws kind of quashed the ability for manufacturers to put out products like this. Skull Dark is a Canada-only blend of Skull, which has been compared to Copenhagen Southern Blend, albeit with what one reviewer called a brown sugar taste. It is unknown if the product is still available. Kodiak Choice was a dipping tobacco released by Conwood, now the American Snuff Company, released and marketed in the 90s to compete directly with Copenhagen and Skull. According to those who had tried the dip, the flavors of Kodiak Choice, Fine Cut Wintergreen, and Straight um, mirror what were popular during the time from the other manufacturers. Choice was taken off the market before the release of Grizzly Moist Snuff, as the need to have two competing mid-tier products is obsolesced by the popularity and uh, advertising push for Grizzly. Seneca Moist Snuff is a dip made by the Lake Erie Tobacco Company, usually limited to sale only from tribal reservations. The dip is pasteurized and available in flavors that are not commonly seen in dipping tobacco paired with the ordinary gamut of flavors. As of the time of writing, the flavors available are original, which is a natural flavor, straight, rum, mint, cream, citrus, soda, and grape. Soda supposedly tastes like root beer, not a difficult flavor to recreate in dip, as most root beers are simply sodas flavored with wintergreen and vanilla. Citrus tasted like grapefruit, and cream tasted like cream soda, or just a plain vanilla. 
The dips are only available in long cut, but are finer than the average dip in the same cut, and they are known for being sold at a deep discount when compared with commonly available dipping tobaccos. From the websites that I can order it from to Florida, one roll, that means five cans, can be purchased for under $20. They are also pasteurized as snooses. Introduced in 2008 and discontinued in 2011, Skull Wintergreen Edge was a variation of Skull's ordinary wintergreen that had an intense mouthfeel and very bold wintergreen flavor, according to those who have tried it and left reviews. It was probably discontinued because of redundancy. Copenhagen Wintergreen, released in 2009 and made by the same company, went on to dominate the dipping tobacco market and Skull Extra, which can be thought of as the successor product to Skull Wintergreen Edge, um, makes claims of flavor and mouthfeel similar to Edge, and it would arrive only a year after Edge's discontinuation. Skull Crisp Blend was a tropical fruit-flavored dipping tobacco available in Canada and briefly in the United States. According to accounts of those who have tried the dip, it was a mix of Skull Apple Blend and Skull Citrus Blend in a ratio that favored the apple. Accounts of seeing the dip in stores dwindled in the mid-2010s and due to ongoing restrictions on smokeless tobacco in Canada, which, as an aside, I'm very happy to report that, at least in Alberta, tobacco taxes in an unprecedented move by the government have been lowered. It is unlikely that the dip is still offered, however, despite this, and if it is, it is surely either old stock or offered on a very limited or hyper-regional basis. Has the exact same history as Skull Crisp Blend, and those who have tried it said it was probably a blend of cherry and berry. This dip appears to have had a larger market than crisp blend in the United States and a smaller market share in Canada, where it was sold for longer despite less people and less advertising push. <laughs> tobacco cuts or bits, simply called Kaltabak in Germany, also known under other names in the regions that it's popular in, like Skrull in Denmark or Tuytabak in Sweden are small bits of tightly rolled, sauced, dark-fired tobacco that are placed in the mouth like dip. Often they are lightly gnawed beforehand to loosen and manipulate the leaves and increase the surface area of the bit. The most popular flavor for these bits is aniseed and licorice. And their use seems to be mostly restricted to northern Germany and southern Denmark, but some brands, like Oliver Twist, see mild success abroad. Brands include Picanel, Grimm und Triple, the oldest ongoing brand in this category, and the aforementioned Oliver Twist. Redman Totems are notable for being the only cut plug product available in the United States, possibly in an attempt to introduce a European scroll product to Americans. According to Hubbard and the few pieces of documented advertising, it was simply Redmond plug compressed into a stick, cut into usable portions, and intended to be used for the on-the-go man, much as scroll is used in Europe. Manufactured likely around the start of the 1900s, not a coping snooze, was a brand of snooze made and sold by UST, a conglomerate that is the precursor to the modern United States smokeless tobacco company. Previous brands under its belt included Helma, which is a dry snuff and moist snuff manufacturer that no longer exists, Wayman, which is responsible for Copenhagen snuff, and others, including a American Red Seal snooze. And all these products, including Copenhagen Snuff, which did start life as a snooze, were direct precursor products to modern dipping tobaccos. This also represents the last time Swedes, which were at this time new immigrants to America, manufactured snooze using traditional fermentation practices. In Sweden, newly developed pasteurization technology became the de facto manufacturing standard. And as I mentioned, 
It would be unknown as to how these early snooses or dips tasted if not for the continued survival of Copenhagen snuff, which has gone through very, very little change from its initial inception. From this, we can assume that, for the most part, they were probably smoky, fermented, salty, with very fine grinds, but not the clay-like uh, kneaded texture we associate with Swedish snus. That is probably a consequence of the pasteurization process and changing tastes in the home country of the immigrants that they left. If you enjoyed this, thanks so much. Like and subscribe. It took a very long time to put all this research together, and I would like to extend a special thanks to everyone who helped me with my research, including Rob Hubbard of the Snuff Takers Ephemeris, Chad Jones of Snooby.com, and Jared from Outlaw. Thanks so much. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.